listening to episode 119 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I have returning to the show, Jim Stevenson Jr. Man, I consider to be one of the world's experts on vitamin D, more accurately named secosteroid hormone D. The quote-unquote vitamin D is actually a hormone. And that information is becoming more known. I've heard that on prominent podcasts before. But what's not known is that supplementing it can actually cause harm and create severe imbalances in the body that even exacerbate autoimmune diseases. So if you haven't heard the first chat with Jim Stevenson Jr. and Morley Robbins, I highly recommend going back and listening to that because this episode kind of builds on that. I would say this one's a little easier to understand. We try to keep it focused and responding to major arguments of the pro-vitamin D supplementation camp. We are definitely in the minority of saying, wait a minute, should probably just get it from light and food and that it's not a life-threatening thing if you have quote-unquote low vitamin D and you have to ask what does that mean which marker and that marker is 25 D but there's actually another form called 1 comma 25 D which is actually the active form where the first one's the storage form 25 D that they test and there's the ratio between them And the story goes a lot deeper than what you hear in the alternative health world, which is why I started MitoLife Radio, because you're listening to alternative, alternative health, where we go one layer deeper or multiple to actually find the reality of the situation, which is often the 180 of what you hear, not only in the conventional arena, but even the alternative health arena. So it's always about questioning what is being pushed. And whenever you see yourself on the side of the majority, it's wise to pause and reflect. That's a quote by Mark Twain. And I don't know why people never realize that when they go to the health food store. All of those supplements on the end caps, right? All of the CBD, all of the ascorbic acid, doesn't mean they're inherently bad. It's just you have to question why are they being pushed so hard and people are popping these supplements like candy there are proper supplements to take which i educate a lot about and it's not vitamin d3 so without further ado here is jim stevenson jr Jim Stevenson, welcome back to the show. Thanks a lot. Glad you're having me. Yeah, yeah. Our last chat with uh, Morley Robbins was a lot of fun. People loved it. I think people got more questions than answers out of it, but that's always the sign of a good show. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking a lot different back then, and I was glad we had Morley on, but now I think we're ready to just go through it. Awesome. Yeah, so... I actually have a list here um, that was sent by uh, one of the people in the uh, debate. It was like a four on one and I felt kind of inadequate um, because I have, thanks to you and Morley, I have part of my head wrapped around uh, the psychosteroid hormone D subject, but I'm still not too well versed on PTH and all of the interrelationships between all of the different systems and, and hormone D. So I think this conversation will be really illuminating uh, for me and listeners just to kind of break down point by point uh, that was actually emailed to me about 30 minutes before the interview. There's about 15 points here uh, that the quote metabolic community believes about vitamin D. And I just want to preface this is not bashing anyone. No, there's no emotion in this. We're just searching for the truth. And I just have more questions than answers when it comes to vitamin D supplementation. It's something I've dabbled in before. I've supplemented everything in the past, and 
it just doesn't make sense to me when I listen to you and Morley talk about it. Uh, it just makes more sense to get it from light and from food. Exactly. And I'm looking at that list. And um, so maybe we should just go ahead and get into it. Um, I see Let's number one. Number one um, says that the metabolic community agrees that high 125D is associated with poor health. So the active form of vitamin D, dihydroxy vitamin D, the one that's found in nightshades, is associated with poor health. I just threw in nightshades for context for people. Um, mm -hmm. Some people do react to them. That's maybe why. Um, the problem with that statement is that the medical community doesn't agree with that. They mm -hmm. won't even test that. They'll only test that if you have sarcoidosis or something like that, um, hyperparathyroidism, some reason to get them to test it. They don't agree that it's just associated with poor health in general, which it is. Interesting. Yeah. And I wanted to give the context too for listeners, because there's basically six different, uh, if you imagine a key and I'll put in the show notes, D3 is the supplement. And this is where people get all confused. Like this is to me, the starting point where I had to start. And it took me like a couple of weeks to get this down. <laughs> um, right. D3 equals cholecalciferol. It's the same thing. 25 D is what they test for. It's a storage form. It's called uh, calcidiol. Right. And then. Correct. Uh, 125D is the one that nobody knows about pretty much. And that's uh, 125-dihydroxy cholecalciferol. So those are like the main three to know, but there's even more than that, right, that you talk about. So. Right. There's there's more than that, but even staying with those three, those are really three levels. Um, those can be comprised of the D2 or the D3, but it stays that. So if you take D2 and it gets stored in your liver and activated, it becomes 25 D2. And then as it becomes activated by the kidneys to become 125 D, it's still D2. And the same is true of D3. And if you happen to take D4, which is in some fungi and there are some supplements. So those are three levels. The, the one is the supplement, the D3, and then it's hydroxy vitamin D and then dihydroxy vitamin D. Got it. Okay. Awesome. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Number two, they say, and this was a big part of the conversation with them. Um, they believe that st stored vitamin D. So again, 25 D is the active D that produces quote, all the good stuff. So 25 D as you say, is the one that always, gets all the accolades, right? <laughs> no, no, no. When all the accolades belong to 125D, mm -hmm. that's because of, um, and it's, it's lowered in the list, because it produces the VDREs, the response elements. So mm -hmm. um, they believe that the stored D is the active D, so they're seeing the 25D, but not in a stored spot obviously because they're basing everything on a serum test where you know it's stored in the liver it's stored in muscle it's stored in bone it's stored in both kinds of fat brown and white so it's stored all over the place but we just happen to choose serum and the analogy i use for that is if you were a car that's your fuel line we don't have a gauge on the liver, the tank, or any of those other storage areas to assess them. Okay, that makes sense. That's a good analogy. Um, uh, and there's not a lot. I mean, I, I assume you could find a study to kind of back up anything, right? Um, I don't. I don't think you can find a study that's going to tell you that stored D twenty five D, even in serum is um, what produces all the good stuff. That's, I mean, that's like referring to flour as producing all the good stuff and you make everything out of it that's a huge variety of things. It's, it's inactive. Um, there's, if you get your blood level above 100, 
NG, the US measurement, that will then trigger bone resorption. Normally that's uh, relegated to the active form, but that's why it's a good rodenticide. Other hmm. than that, it just becomes, if you look at any pathway for it, you see it either goes to, the, basically I say to the side, if you look at the diagram, 2, 4, 2, 5 D, or it becomes 1, 25 D. There, there are more uh, charts out there that have more molecules on it, but this is the world we're dealing with. So let's talk about it. And those are your choices. And 25 D doesn't have any biological activity unless you get it above 100. And that's a really old study that I'm referencing, probably from the 70s. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And later I want to circle back to the bone resorption thing because okay. uh, the whole calcification thing is something that I'm really fascinated with. Um, and I'd love to, to talk about that um, in, in the context of vitamin D supplementation. Um, and so no, number three, the point is taking, uh, wait, taking 25 D can lower 125 D. You can't really right. take 25 D though, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you actually, you, they give it in some of the studies. And it, if something naturally has D3, this is where the nutrition charts are all messed up and you can't help but think it's on purpose. 25D is in most things that have D3 naturally. So it's in eggs and salmon and anything else that naturally has the, the D3. So if you look it up, there's a bit in there and it's more powerful than D3, so to speak. So it's worth knowing you're getting it directly and naturally. But I, I mean, I don't know where this is coming from. Taking that can lower 125D. That's, that's like saying bringing home some flour from the store is going to cause some bread to disappear from home. I don't see how that's, do we have a study that, uh, that's not how it works. 25 OHD is going to become something. It's, it doesn't help usher out something that's already there and active. Think, think about that act. I'm going to take, oh, let's say we agree, we're going to take the 25 directly, or even if you're going to take D3 and you're going to somehow increase your 25 D, why is that going to lower your 125 D? 125 D has a diurnal rhythm and a half life of eight to 12 hours. Just having some more of its substrate arrive doesn't tell it to get out of town. That just doesn't make any sense. Your immune response molecule is 125D. That's what's going to determine how much of that you have, not pushing in D3 or how much 25D you have. It's a decision the body makes. Interesting. And it can go both ways. Is that correct? Or? Which, wait, what do you mean? The 25 yeah. Mm -hmm. The 25 can go, yeah, it can go multiple ways, actually. Um, just like 125D, when it leaves, it has multiple, I don't want to confuse things, but multiple molecules it leaves in. And I listened to the recording and they were talking about leaving, I think it's called calcitrolic acid or it's a form of acid that it leaves as that's considered to be inactive. But that's one of at least four things that can break active D 125 D can break down into. And if you do some searches for that acid, you'll find it isn't inert. It actually has a bunch of activity. I can't remember. I think it might be either that or bile acid can activate the VDR. I'm, I could be confusing the two, but one of those two does. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, I should have linked you some of the studies. Let me see in the in the chat here, I just put a few that they sent, um, I guess, quote, proving that supplemental D um, will lower 125D. <laughs> no, but is it, uh, I don't have the study in front of me, but is it your typical study where they did some measurements and they didn't even see what it became and it's associated with it being lower over time? I mean, it has an eight hour half-life. Did we really wow. track it? You have to take your D3 and it takes seven days to become 25 D. And then at that point, the body has to decide to activate it. So unless you're tracking these molecules, you can associate all day long, but it doesn't really mean anything. 
I haven't read those studies directly myself, Matt, but I'm sure that they're not going to bear out. They're going to be like I said. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I put them put them in the chats if it's easy for you to pull up. But um, there's a lot of reference to postmenopausal women too, which I think we talked about how that's yeah. not very accurate. <laughs> no, because pro prolactin comes into play. You. So I wanted to get back. You were talking about the taking the 25 D or the 2,5-D can go either way. Was that what you were asking me? It can become different Correct. molecules? Correct, yeah. Okay, well, mm -hmm. but see, that's the thing. Let's step back one level from there to the D3. If they were taking D3, which is the basis of most arguments, is whether or not to take the D3. So D3 has a lot of ways it can go, and it does not have to become 25-D. That is... I just like glumasterol it has a lot of other choices and it can become multiple different forms of 25d and we only check some of them and it if it's stored we're not checking it yeah and that was really when my alarm bells went off when i learned that from you that d3 can be stored as d3 which is totally unnatural right that would never happen ever in nature <laughs> Maybe momentarily, if you got your hands on on the right thing, I think I said like maybe some salmon roe, if you gorged on it rather than saving it, you might be able to, you know, really spike yourself pretty good. But it has all the cofactors with it. And, you know, they don't usually do that. It's a resource that's held on to. Um, but other than that, no, you're not going to build D3 in your blood until you've built your 25D level in your blood to a certain point. It's around it. 80, it's around 80 nanomole. Okay. Not the, in, in, not our NG one, the other one, that's the reference that I have, but around 80 nanomole is when the 25D starts to, uh, well, when you take D3, that's the point at which it starts to build both of them. Before that, it all makes its way to 25D. And at that point, when you've taken enough D3 to get yourself to 80 nanomole, then the D3 will start to build in the blood. And it'll get way up there. If you're taking over 2000 IU, it will build D3 in your blood if you're taking that daily. Wow, just 3000. To over 2,000, yes. Yeah, 2,000 safe, but anything over that, it'll start to build. Yeah, then the fourth point is uh, that vitamin D is, quote, very metabolic. Thus, it uses more magnesium, copper, vitamin A, and vitamin K. So I guess they're kind of making the argument that similar to carbohydrate and sugar, that will increase your nutrient requirements as your metabolic rate increases. And that's not a bad thing. And so they're saying that supplementing vitamin D causes that same effect. Is that true? <laughs> well, I would say that in, you know, you can take that sentence and it doesn't really use those things. Those things are involved in the health of the body, um, especially take vitamin A out of there. It doesn't use vitamin A per se. They're both the dimers in the heterodimerization. They're both necessary. So Stand alone, you need vitamin A. Stand alone, you need vitamin D. Difference is you don't make vitamin A, you make vitamin D. But you will use magnesium activating and all those are downstream or upstream effects or actions or molecules needed just for the healthy body, just like the vitamin K and the copper, you know, that nobody's going to be talking about. Yeah, I think I've heard Morley say that to convert... Um, D3 to 25D and then 25D to 125, the conversions are catalyzed partially by magnesium. Is that correct? They're magnesium dependent yeah, conversion. They are. And there's, there's a nice uh, graph of that and I'll get that to you so that you can post it. It shows each step of the way where they're used. And the problem also with that number four is that it says vitamin D is very metabolic. Again, that's Smurf language, which, uh, it's going through the steps that it uses those things. Maybe I guess that's a fair statement in that sense. But th this this list throughout continually says vitamin D, and you're left to to wonder which which molecule are we talking about here? 
Yeah, it's a very ambiguous uh, term, right, to just say vitamin D. And that's what 99% of people say when they say I'm low in quote unquote vitamin D, but you really have to specify which one, right? <laughs> right. And depending upon what level you're at, some people might get some good advice and be told take vitamin D3 and other people will read that response and they'll just go, oh my. But some people need to be told that it just depends on what level you're at. But uh, there's a lot of different vitamin D, you know, and there's a lot of different molecules and some of them are super powerful and some of them are pretty mundane. Mm -hmm. um, so the next point here, number five is uh, vitamin D and calcium will lower PTH stands for parathyroid hormone and 125 D. Um, vitamin D again, we're <laughs> left. So taking D3, are they saying in this case will lower the 125 that, D think, or I when think... you see a change in the 25 D that's going to lower the, the 125 D. But the problem here is you've got to be talking about ionized calcium because that's the one at play always. And that's why it's hard to get tested. The typical game, you know, they're going to measure the form that really isn't very helpful to you. And we've known for decades that 125D through its diurnal rhythm and PTH, they're directly linked. We don't have to get 125D to some certain level before they associate. And that's the case with 25D. It, look at all the arguments to have 25D control PTH. It has to be at this certain level. It has to get to 80 nanomole before it finally stabilizes, as they say. Well, the other one we've known, like I said, for decades is they're directly linked, that and ionized calcium, 125D, PTH, and ionized calcium. But to get the focus and to prop up the new goal which is around that 80 nanomole or so, we want to have PTH associated with 25D. That's the new thing. Hmm. Wow. So that's like that. That's the big convincing argument right there. <laughs> it is. And why would that make sense? Why would a seasonal variation molecule be in control of PTH when right here in these same notes, it'll tell you that PTH together with 125D are in control of serum calcium and they are. So why would you think that people had to somehow be ready in the winter historically to feed themselves vitamin D that they somehow have lying around in the deep winter to maintain a level of a seasonal variation molecule? It's a good thing we don't focus on D3 since we don't make any of that in the winter. Can you imagine? I don't know what kind of dosage we would be taking then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the focus, um, especially in the debate, was that the main controlling factor for parathyroid hormone, which just to clarify for the listener, you don't, you don't want high parathyroid hormone, right? You want it to be in a certain lower rate. I mean, you still need some, but you don't want it to be above a certain level. So that's the, that's the, that was the big argument. That debate is that the big, con the main controlling factor is quote unquote vitamin D <laughs> yeah. for controlling PTH. So, but there's more, there's more um, variables, right. Than just vitamin D, like you said, calcium and yeah, ionized calcium, the the triple the triple axis that what they call the hypercalcemia axis is the 125D ionized calcium and the PTH, parathyroid hormone. And those three are the ones that tell you that's they're the three that go together. So if you throw in just calcium, it's typically normal and it can still be normal people that have elevated ionized calcium and you'll have people that will have low 25d coupled with high 125d and they might have a pth issue but they're only getting 25d measured so they'll be blaming their pth 
number on their 25D and be giving them more D. And these are the people pulling bone. It's 125D that decides to pull bone. That's the bone one, that with the PTH. They are absolutely correct about that. If you read though, PTH tells your body to take the calcium from bone, whereas 125D tells it to take it from the gut. Big difference. But you've got to watch that axis. You don't want to be only looking at 25D and have a really high 125D because during all that, you're going to be doing bone resorption because of the two molecules involved with building, building bone, there's the osteoblasts, B-L-A-S-T-S, -S, and the osteoclasts, C-L-A-S-T-S. -S. So, only one of them has a vitamin D receptor, only one of those cell lines, and it's the ones that tear down bone, the osteoblasts. That's in DeLuca's work. So you don't want to be taking all kinds of vitamin D and not looking at your 125D. You could be hyperparathyroid. You, you could have all, any number of things. You've got to look at that molecule because that's the one that's going to destroy your bone. If that number's high. It's going to be coupled with low 25D, and in most cases, they're going to be telling you to take vitamin D. And in that recording and in this list here, they keep saying taking vitamin D will lower the active form. And I absolutely, that what mechanism provides for that? That doesn't even make sense. Does that even make sense to you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the study here is by, I, I don't know how many studies you've looked through, 2000 Vith, R Vith is the main one. They uh, improved cholecalciferol nutrition in rats is non-calcemic, suppresses parathyroid hormone, and increases responsiveness to 125D. Um, and it goes through it. But increases responsiveness to 125D. It's an interesting statement. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just here again, um, we're, we're talking about rodents mm -hmm. and they're nocturnal. Let's point that out. They're nocturnal and we're talking about the sunshine molecule. <laughs> so that's a big difference. And their immune system doesn't line up with us. There's those things called toll-like receptors, TLRs, and we don't align with mice, but we use them in studies for various reasons. Um, some of them make sense. Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, and I, I always say that it's impossible to control for all the variables. I mean, uh, non-native electromagnetic fields, the artificial light, the, and, and these things have powerful effects on blood sugar, insulin, immune response, endocrine, uh, endocrine system function, everything. So. I don't know. I just, I, I tend to take studies now with a grain of salt, especially when you just look at all of the money behind them. Right. Um, right. Well, we're already fortified too. We, in 1932, we decided this was a huge problem and we've been fortified ever since. And we're acting like that's the baseline. Like you inherited a thyroid patient that's already on this huge treatment and you're saying, whoa, these people are deficient. They need some more. This, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. And the fact that there's not any data sets on the active form is really disturbing. It really is. We have people that you can get a graph of the COVID people and you can get their 25D to show you how the lowest ones are faring the worst. And they have all those, but you can't find a single measurement of the active form of vitamin D. But on that same list of patients, you can probably find which genetic mutation of COVID some of them had. We've got DNA down to the PCR level that you wouldn't believe, but we can't get an active vitamin D test on these dying people, dying by the millions. Something's not right. And you know it's not low, so it doesn't explain 
taking it doesn't explain it. Right. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because um, I'm not bashing the metabolic community, but there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on calcium instead of magnesium. And this is like a repeat thing who I respect or I love his work. But I think that to me, magnesium is more important than calcium because it regulates calcium. Right. And when I look at right. just I mean, America's calcified it or the Western world, I think that's very apparent. And it's not from dairy and what people think. It's from the water supply. It's from uh, various factors, but largely the the hard water to me, the tap water, the spring water, the well water, because we accumulate that calcium. And then you just add vitamin D on top of it and fortified milk or whatever, fortified foods and supplements. And it's just right. fueling that fire, right, of, of calcification. Right. Well, and vitamin D sets the calcium level, period. That's its job. So if you're getting calcium in your diet, it's telling your body, I'm sorry, if you're getting vitamin D in your diet, it's telling you, you need more calcium. So if it's not in your diet at the same time, it's going to come from bone. And it's like you said, cows have, they pass on lots of calcium in their milk. Do they not? I mean, they get it from eating grass. So we don't need to make it so complex. They give us a lot of calcium. I think it's like four times what we get in nature. And we, we just don't need any more. You're right. The American society has way too much calcium. That's why you can't treat anyone with 125D. Hector DeLuca said in other countries, they would treat people with osteoporosis with 125D. But because we have so much calcium in our diet, no doctor would do that here. And if you look at the MS protocols in those diets, they're total calcium avoidance. They have to be because you'll, you'll calcify like crazy. But you have to still realize that the vitamin D will cause you to pull it from bone. And that's why we can't use 125D in the United States for osteoporosis because we got there by a different mechanism. We didn't get there from malnutrition or a lack of natural sun. We got there because we took too much vitamin D our whole life and we just made our skeleton porous. And in some cases, we actually exhausted our telomeres to make osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And they're happy with that because there's drugs like Boniva that you can take when that happens to you when you get really old. Whoa, what does that one do? <laughs> that one stops the process so your your bone stays there. But when you finally have a break, it's really old and it's typically life-threatening. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, I was trying to pull up a, a video here if I can find it. Um, have you heard of Tom Levy ever? He, he, he had a lecture like Death by Calcium. <laughs> No, but I have read the a lot of stuff at the Not Milk mm -hmm. page. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I've read a lot of interesting stuff about calcium. Yeah, it's interesting how people are, tend to be one or the other. Like, obviously, they're both important, right? But um, if I had to pick one for me, it would be magnesium <laughs> that I would focus on. Right. But, right. Well, magnesium, well, you should get – twice as much magnesium as you get calcium in your diet just to be safe that's a general rule i think if you run into anybody that has a general rule um, if you look at the magnesium molecule um, or if you look at sorry chlorophyll and then compare that to the hem molecule h-e-m-e -E, the oxygen carrying part of the blood those two are kind of counterparts chlorophyll and hem if you ask me the, the center, plant blood and animal blood, right? The center of one is magnesium and the center of the other one is iron. I think that's pretty telling. You eat your plants, you get your magnesium, you eat your animals, you get your iron. Right. That makes total sense. Um, yeah, and I wanted to go into all that because I think you can't talk about hormone D in this whole subject without talking about calcium and all these other factors, right? Because they're linked. <laughs> right. Um, so number, number six, just to kind of keep moving down the list here is that, um, 
this is actually, I guess, a, a quote from Ray Pete. Uh, parathyroid hormone increases 125D, and together they increase blood calcium. Um, I guess we could just tackle that part first. Right. It's they work together with ionized calcium, and I have a paper that I could give you afterwards about it. Um, they they work together. It isn't that necessarily PTH because either one of those can rise because they have other influences. So the mm -hmm. PTH isn't the only way one two five D can rise. Think about it, and one two five D isn't the only way PTH can rise. So those it doesn't work like that. And you can't take PTH. So they're concerned about 125D increasing PTH, but at the same time, they're telling you PTH is increasing it. It's a circular conversation at this point, is it not? Did, did that make right. sense? Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, yeah, and then they go on to say calcidiol lowers PTH and blood calcium, and that accounts for much of its effect preventing inflammatory autoimmune diseases, for example. And that gets back to what we were talking about before. Um, now, this is the, the repeat reference, but that was where you talked about that paper with the rats or with the rodents in it and stuff. So that's mm -hmm. the paper, one of the papers or the type of papers they'll be using to establish that somehow lower levels of D, lower molecules of D, eradicate the higher level molecule of vitamin D. It just doesn't stand a reason. A substrate doesn't chase off what it becomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now it, it kind of gets into some Gilbert Ling stuff, receptor idea, um, which you can kind of make that argument against really any health claim, right? <laughs> it's just, oh, if receptors don't exist, then it's invalid, but that's kind of a non-argument to me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, the thing is the, the receptors all exist if the body wants them to. And there's a ton of different, there's no need to even talk about how many different molecule type receptors and expressions of them and where they are and where they can be expressed or not expressed because we haven't really figured out the molecules for most of them. We, we know some of them. It depends on whether it was beneficial for science to go down some of these avenues. And we know about a lot of areas where we see them working in treating things for us. They seem to know a lot in those areas. But take vitamin A, for example, that's throughout this document. That's, you know, it's one of the most pivotal things in the whole conversation is vitamin A has to be there for vitamin D to even matter. And we can't even get that molecule correct 2016 was the finally found the right molecule and then you learn that that's vitamin a5 don't blink it's the fifth one but it's the right one we should be redoing so much science it's unbelievable you imagine if you had to scrap the first four versions of say uh, magnesium malate or some standalone molecule actually there's only one representation of like folate if all of a sudden you said oh we we're really on folate five you know forget the first four we were wrong <laughs> yeah that that's actually what i was uh it's a good segue to number eight because here's another repeat quote uh he's talking about the conversion with sunlight and he says the sun starts the synthesis by breaking down the seven dehydrocholesterol molecule leading to cholecalciferol which is changed in the liver to calcidiol, the protective form. But what you were just saying, like you educated me about lumisterol the past few months, and he didn't mention that once. And you said it's a totally different pathway, and there's tons of things that are made from lumisterol, right? So to just discard it and not even mention lumisterol at all right. uh, is a tragedy. Yes. Well, and then he might not really be familiar with it because – they labeled it inert. They don't measure it. Um, it's called pre D3. But in a lot of the graphs, it's shown after D3 is produced. And that's the photo liable aspect that the sun continues to break it down past the D3 level. 
it, you know, that's what the light is doing to the rings in there. It's breaking them. And it's, you know, I don't even understand it myself, but as it gets to D3, it can go past that. You know, that's, you don't want to get too much sun um, because you burn, but you're going to be making, as long as you don't burn, you're going to be making a lot of that bypass or pre or post D3. It doesn't matter what you call it, but it's lumisterol. And that has its own class of molecules. There's, you know, there's L3, there's 20 L3. There's, I don't remember how many molecules, doesn't matter. Just like D3 can become 25D and 125D, L3 can become some molecules similar in its own family. But it also is a substrate, just like 7D hydrocholesterol is a substrate to become it, it is a substrate for another pathway of vitamin D molecules, the one, the CYP11A1 pathway. So it can make the 20 OHD3 for that pathway. And it also is an active molecule for the vitamin D receptor, the membrane version. So it's truly a lot more important in my mind than D3. And you pointed out, you mentioned in the video or in the recording that it was good for 72 hours after its creation. Yes, it can revert back to D3 if you didn't make enough D3 in the sun without sun for 72 hours. So it can go all those different directions. That's why it's important to get reasonable sun as often as you can, because that's the molecule you'll charge your body with. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's what I really don't understand about the vitamin D uh, supplementation obsession. And I think people have said like um, Danny in the, in the interview said, or the debate that a lot of people can't afford. And he referenced a specific brand and a specific light and expensive one at that, the spur T $450 or whatever vitamin D lamp. But I mean, when I got into light therapy about four or five years ago, I went to the reptile store or I went online. I ordered a reptile UVB bulb. Sure. You don't have to spend 400 bucks. That's <laughs> just no. one brand. <laughs> That's Holix light. That's Holix light, right. by the way. Right. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a good light. Don't get me wrong. It's not just UVB. I think it's a mix. There's mm -hmm. a Fuji tan one and there's another one. There are two really popular ones by him. But um, yeah, you don't have to spend a lot. I just really worry about messing with your circadian rhythm those guys like to talk a lot about the metabolic, you know, dysfunction and all that. That gets at, you know, putting in a lot of unrealistic pills of vitamin D that, you, like we talked about, you wouldn't run into in nature. But I think it also goes for not going crazy with the artificial light, too, because that's going to confuse your body with your storage. It just in general, that's the whole thing we're worried about with the computers, is it not? We're already worried about the light to the retinas and our circadian timing and all that. So if you go and make vitamin D for your body at a time that it's it's like, wow, it's winter, what's going on? And you do it in the middle of the night and you didn't go halfway across the world, you know, if you really, really needed it for some reason, I could see it being beneficial. But outside of that, I think I don't, I can't find a need for it anymore. I really just can't. Yeah, I have a few books on ultraviolet light and I know they've used it as an uh, antiviral before, like uh, UV blood irradiation, like literally sure. needle into the vein, shining UV light in. Um, and there's a great book called Into the Light. If anyone's interested, it goes through all the studies on UV light. But as Morley said in a recent talk, he, he believes vitamin D is such a small aspect to sunlight because there's so many other things, right? There's beta endorphin that you make. There's the nitric oxide right. effect. There's like a million things that happen and everyone is like vitamin D, vitamin D. It's like, that's like 1% or 5% of the, of right. the benefit. <laughs> right. And we're looking at the, the wrong molecules anyway, because there are so many other molecules that matter. When you start looking, um, if, if a person wanted to, 
and, and most people don't, but that other pathway that I'm talking about that has all those other molecules like 20 OHD3, if you just go and look up Lumistrarol L3 or the 20 OHD3, you'll immediately start to see that those, oh. sorry about that, that those yeah. are really serious anti-cancer molecules. They're natural sunscreens. They're things you want to be producing in your skin when you're in the sun because your body makes those in your skin when you're in the sun. And that gets at why you don't want to always be washing your forearms because we always talk about all the other vitamin D that you make that they measure, the 25D. But there's a lot of different forms of vitamin D that you make in your skin. And also there's some that you make on your skin. It's it's not what they've looked at isn't the vitamin D that we're concerned with, but what they haven't looked at could be, if that makes sense. So if your hair follicles, the sebum, S-E-B-U-M, I believe, follicles, which make some D3, if they also make like 20 OH D3, which is sunscreen or lumisterol, you want to leave that in your skin there because it's a natural sunscreen. If we wash it off every night, we're going to burn. We're going to be lacking an anti-cancer molecule because it really truly is on the surface. This is hard to find stuff. The paper that I've seen is from 1937. Interesting. Uh, and it's in the oils on the skin, right? So I'd imagine not taking a steaming shot, hot shower and having it more on the lukewarm side is probably better. I think a lot of people do steaming hot showers in tap yeah. water. <laughs> and then just use your soap and your underarms and your groin unless you're actually soiled. And then you really need to actually remove, you know, if you're soiled, you need to soap up and, and deal with it. But there's also going to be um, skin flora also, just like there's gut flora. I don't know if you and I have talked about that, but just Google it. There's skin flora is very real. You don't want to be getting rid of it. There's there's good and bad, just like inside your gut. So um, you want to maintain that along with all those vitamin D molecules because some areas of your body can't be serviced by the blood delivery system. They're, they're far too remote. And those are the areas where the 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 keratinocytes, if that's how you say it, they actually make all the stuff you need right there for you. And then it's, it's local where it can't be delivered. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, uh, do you want to jump into some of these questions, Jim? Cause we have quite a few and I think, uh, I have a good segue here with what you were just talking about. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Awesome. Uh, what would you say to someone who's Dr said to stay out of the sun because of skin cancer history. <laughs> I, you'd have to look at what kind of skin cancer history the family had. Um, most of the skin cancers you get from the sun, people really are concerned about, but they're really mundane. And the studies show that for the disease burden that they prevent over the your life, having a couple what we call mundane cancers removed those are like the antibodies that you get when you get a vaccine, the sunlight being the vaccine that prevented the more lethal cancers that you might have succumbed to. And, and that's clear. I mean, the World Health Organization has a pretty new paper out on that talking about the disease burden that's prevented compared to the little tiny amount. And I don't mean to, you know, you know say that it's not an, matter it doesn't matter that somebody lost someone to skin cancer but you've got to look at exactly which type of skin cancer we're talking about here and then there's probably unfortunately a, a cannabinoid that would have been quite effective there to be honest with you right yeah that's a good point i i've been getting back into pemf and there's different beliefs on that um i've, I've experimented over the years and i think it has some benefit but for melanoma there was a study showing like 90 percent melanoma skin cancer wiped out within two weeks just with pulsed emf therapy <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of stuff out there that people don't know about I think but but yeah right. cannabinoids are are powerful for sure um right and another thing too is most i always say reasonable sun and throughout my life i've 
failed to just get reasonable sun many, many times. I have suffered some of the most horrific burns you can imagine just through stupidity, even as an adult. Um, I really mean it, reasonable sun, and, and you find other ways to, to cover up. And um, But you can get reasonable sun, and you can do it every day probably, and it'll make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and someone asked how much daily sunlight does one need not be deficient um i've heard before like 10 to 15 minutes is it, it i mean it it matters the uv index right yeah the that. uv it needs to be above three to really be producing anything um sometimes though clouds can enhance uv they don't always block it you can get a really bad sunburn in the in the clouds it's, it's always different but i usually go out i try to get sun every day but there are also certain ways that you set the tone to get sun, and I'm not versed in that uh, morning light and some other things, of course, that I, I don't have the skills to address. Maybe you do, but I, I do know that they say that's important to set the tone for the light. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I could relate getting a sunburned my whole childhood, I remember, mostly on my neck and shoulders and back. But uh, knowing what I know now, vitamin E and just saturated fats are very protective. Um, I noticed if I do that and I used to do like carrot juice and beta carotene, but I wouldn't do that anymore knowing what I know now. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think the sunglasses make a big difference too. I, um, I had a friend who was going to medical school and we went to a graduation party and everybody was playing volleyball. And she said, look at all the sunburned people and look at all the people that aren't sunburned. And she said, the people that are sunburned were the ones wearing their sunglasses today at the outside ceremony. And it was really interesting. Um, it, your body's pretty efficient at shuffling the melanin it has on the fly, like a bunch of umbrellas in your skin somehow to prevent you from getting burned. I, I don't know how it does it, but it does. It's pretty amazing within reason. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, someone asked, how terrible is sunscreen for you? <laughs> There's some metals in there, right? Some aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> I, they're all different, and but they're all bad because they're all going to just block the UVB, unfortunately. And uh, I don't really even, what's the point in, you might as well use some zinc oxide then. <laughs> I, just, I, there are some, some sunscreens that work that are probably healthy out there, but you'd have to spend a lot of time researching them. I, I wish I knew, but I just wouldn't use sunscreen. I'd use something else. I'd cover up. I'd do any other number of things other than using sunscreen unless I needed some zinc oxide on my nose or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they make a lot of like long sleeve UV blocking clothing now, right? So They, they do. Readable. I see that in the stores, the hats. You can get scarves. There's a lot of good things like that. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, after the necessary 20 minutes in sunlight, what happens to our skin and cells? So a sunburn, I mean, that's oxidative stress, right? Well, what's happening at first, and it looks bad, the first bit is your body's actually sunning the blood, okay? That's why uh, through, through several mechanisms, like the nitric oxide through the UVA piece, but your body actually is going to send the blood into the tissues. That's how it lowers the blood pressure, and it's going to literally sun it and you, this is Jack Cruz type stuff. It's going to gather photons. It's going to gather energy and light. It's going to take it back inside the body. So that little, what, eurythmal dose that they do recommend, that's what that's doing. And Chris Cross has some really good stuff on that. You know, how it prevents arterial sclerosis, how getting regular sun does. He has it at that Sunlight Institute. I have the paper if you want it. But that's really the initial. If you you go too long, you're seeing more than just the presence of the blood being there. You're seeing starting to do your oxidative stress and starting to to tear things up. But if you had a substrate of like several weeks built up of lumisterol and 20 H 20 OHD3 in the skin there, it could be a different game. Hmm. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and someone asked, uh, talk about the solar callus where that fits in. I think that's a Jack Cruz phrase. 
but that's what you were just talking about pretty much right that setting the tone that's I, i'm sure that's a part of that and it has to do with red light and other light um what it makes me think of and i haven't been able to find this reference for a while some of the heliotherapy work on the tuberculosis people they like to sun a lot of the body before they would expose the trunk they called it seasoning the body before they exposed the trunk so they waited um that's a, a totally different disease um yeah, that's a granulomatous disease it's right there with cancer and sarcoidosis those those are the diseases that convert the vitamin d all the way to 125 d very rapidly uh, a granuloma is just a ball of macrophages they walled off something they can't kill that's what a tumor is we don't call them tumors in tb but that's what they are and they're tumors in sarcoidosis they're just all over the body so those things convert like crazy. And I, I want to address one thing from the recording. The, mm -hmm. the one thing that was getting talked about and gets talked about here is how 25D lowers 125D. And I keep saying that doesn't make sense. It's the immune response molecule. Um, that's why you don't want to put more vitamin D in is because those disease states over convert it those are the ones that you know block the vitamin d receptor and so in the conversations in the recording the solution was my 125d is high hmm i need to take some d3 and via 25d it's going to lower that without ever considering why do we have 125d it's immune response could i have been having immune response and when i checked later since it has an 8 to 12 hour half-life how many half-lives am i away from that other test could it be that my immune response is over and the answer isn't that i took some vitamin d so you got to remember what the 125d is for and somebody pointed out that we point out that it's for the immune response it's all the accolades belong to it it's what we're chasing so don't assume it's just high just because that the body didn't make that decision and let's take some more vitamin d and that's the answer some people are probably lucky that they have a, a body like that that isn't already dysregulated and they can get away with that we know lots of people that can't get away with that yeah that was another pivotal point in my understanding um to understand from you that um the 125 it's high for a reason and it, it that reason is because of um oftentimes a chronic infection right right a chronic infection and it could be an infection it's fighting and it's going to be successful at unfortunately they don't measure that stuff enough you have a lot of people that have a lot of viral tests like Epstein-Barr and they see where they wax and wane. They have a lot of different ones they look at, uh, different antigens they look at. Same thing with Lyme. You have to almost know which tests are worth doing and which aren't. Well, anytime one of those was spiking, like the EBNA3 of Epstein-Barr is spiking, you might see a spike of 125D right then. But those are the molecules that are taking the vitamin D receptor. So that's when it goes to the thyroid. And that's when those are, those are the molecules wandering around. You need to worry about. There was a lot of conversation muddying the water, bringing in pregnenolone and uh, progesterone and uh, DHEA and all these other molecules without taking into account where the excess 125D goes to begin with. It goes to all those other receptors. That's well established. Wow. And, and it what and what happens then? <laughs> they can't do they can't do their job. So if let's say for example, Epstein Barr is flaring in somebody and it all three, EBNA one, two and three, all three of them displace vitamin D from the receptor. So the, but their presence, the cytokine action of their presence creates lots of 125D, makes it activated. The body activates it to that level. So now it can't get to its receptor where it would make 
antimicrobial peptides and warriors like macrophages and T cells to kill it. So it can't do its chemical or biological warrior task. Also, when it goes and it takes the thyroid hormone receptor away from the thyroid hormone, the thyroid hormone can't do its job and regulate the thyroid. When it goes to the adrenal or the glucocorticoid, those two receptors also make chemical warriors. People don't know that. They make more antimicrobial peptides than the vitamin D receptors themselves. And they make a lot of the same ones. And so when vitamin D can't get to its receptor, it can't make the antimicrobial peptides. Then it takes out the other systems. They can't do their functions and some of them can't make the antimicrobial peptides either. So we have no chemical warriors to take out the Epstein-Barr that's created this vicious firestorm, self-perpetuating in fact. Wow. And so someone in that situation, that hypothetical that takes D3, they're just making their situation worse, right? By displacing yeah, it's ga- those receptors. It's gasoline on the fire. And they were talking about activating the vitamin D receptor in all forms of it. Now, all forms of it in that conversation was only about three, three unique molecules. To be honest, you mentioned there's there's tons. So when they say all the molecules activate the vitamin D receptor, let's put it in context. They're only talking about a couple because that's the depth of that conversation molecule wise. And on top of that, what does activate the vitamin D receptor mean to them? And which one are they talking about? The membrane or the nuclear? Not that it matters, but Activating the vitamin D receptor is doing what you talked about later in the recording, making VDREs, which means the two dimers come together, they heterodimerize, they go into the nucleus and they kick out VDREs. That's activating the vitamin D receptor. Just sitting in the vitamin D receptor is what Epstein-Barr antigen does. If you want to call that activating the VDR, then go for it. It has no meaning. It's not meaningful at all to even say it or talk about it. Activating the vitamin D receptor has biological actions. It's not a parking spot. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Um, yeah, it, of, of all the fat soluble vitamins, I mean, A, D, E, e and K. K. The, the D is the hormone one. I think that's what, like the vitamin term is not accurate. No. <laughs> I got called out for that. I don't know if you heard that during, it was the start of the debate. And it goes, Danny said, why, or near the end of it, why do, why do you call it a hormone? It's like, well, it is, right? <laughs> yeah. You could get away with calling D3 a vitamin maybe. Um, but they're Seiko steroid hormones. And that just, they are one carbon ring they have one open carbon ring otherwise it'd be a a full-blown steroid if that carbon ring was closed um they they're the most powerful naturally occurring steroid in the human body you can only get a more powerful one from the doctor wow um we had some questions about getting vitamin d from food and this is a good one how does natural D and food differ from cholecalciferol supplements. And you mentioned um, you're not just getting D3, but you're also getting, um, what was the other one you get in food? Um, 25D. So what it becomes in the liver. So, and that's if the stuff naturally contains the D3. Say you have a a chunk of salmon and it has some D3 in it. Um, It'll have some 25D in it which gets to the point of storage. <laughs> um, there's, a, I, don't, I don't know why fish have D3 in their muscle. Maybe we have D3 in our muscle. I don't know, I haven't looked, but we definitely have 25D in our muscle. There's a pretty new study out that shows that muscle is a major reservoir of 25D, but we don't measure it. So 
the problem is that when that's probably not too bad you take it in in salmon it's built into the food somehow your body breaks it down natural digestion as opposed to a big old pill that drops in so you drop in a big old pill of vitamin d and they tell you you need to take it with fat was who knows what it's about what kind of binders and glue it has in that or maybe it's in a bad oil maybe it is a caplet full of something there's a lot of different ways it arrives down there but it Coming in with fat as if it's like a dry, dead pill because steroids are fats. They're complex lipids. They're already a fat. And so they're going to get acquired like a fat does, which means that it's going to get picked up by the lymphatic system and LDL cholesterol is going to shuttle it. And I keep telling people that that's just LDL cholesterol's job to grab it and shuttle it. It's shuttling it because it's a fat. It doesn't have a map to the liver to say deliver it, how would that work? Does it have a different map for the vitamin K that's arriving the same way that's also a fat soluble? That I mean, do they have, does it go, oh, hey, this is K, I, this map I need, where do I take this? Um, it could just deposit in the very first fat it finds. Just look at the fish, the salmon that you're eating, it was right there in its muscle. There's, there's no telling, it, it isn't destined to go and become part of your immune system that's why you get the lion's share from sunlight. It's not how you deliver steroids to the body. The skin receptor system, I sent you that paper, has that entire system covered. It can make all of the steroids, the skin, in sunlight. You don't have to tax your adrenal system. You only do that when you're putting in pollutants or you're already messed up or you're fighting things. It's not natural naturally the skin would handle it. Wow. Um, this is a really good one. Why do people feel better while supplementing? Is it an immune suppression thing? It's, that's part of it. There are, there are real effects of it because it is a very powerful psychosteroid hormone. Um, there's, okay, so the placebo effect is very real even at the biological level that people see this as a it's a hurdle for them it's an insult if you bring up placebo um because they're about 60 percent effective when they do chemo trials and the way that they're effective is interesting because the people that are getting the placebo they anticipate that their hair is going to fall out and, it'll, and a lot of them do, their hair falls out. That's a biological manifestation of something because they believed it. The sad thing is that they only believed in the negative aspect of it because they didn't believe in the positive aspect. Otherwise they would have cured their cancer with the placebo as well. So placebo is real. And think about when people find vitamin D. They're, it's like getting a Lyme diagnosis or something else. They're at the end of their rope and all of a sudden, here's an answer. And the story they tell you makes sense. The vitamin D deficiency story sells real well. And be, obviously, look at what we're up against. So it, it really does. They can cause a biological effect by believing in it. Or they can have a immune suppression from the placebo. The, I mean, from the uh, steroid effect of it. So yeah, both, but both are real and both are powerful and both are biological manifestations of reality. That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could, I could attest because I used to sell algae oil, which I like speak out against now. It's like a vegan omega-3 DHA uh, supplement, like a liquid and uh, people were getting better on it. And knowing what I know now, I'm like, I don't know how that was possible, but it was the placebo is <laughs> what I understand now, that's why people are getting better. Um, so interesting stuff. Um, here are good, a few good questions from my friend Lauren, had her on the show. Vitamin D in pregnancy research uh, showed 4,000 IUs associated with better outcomes. What are your thoughts on vitamin D in pregnancy? Well, when uh, so they mentioned to you in the recording that uh, – you talked about the spikes of 125D during pregnancy, 40%. And 
somebody mentioned that they have a prolactin spike. So they're admitting uh, that prolactin spikes 125D. Um, that's kind of interesting in and of itself, I would think. And I mentioned to you about that, that those people are going to be labeled deficient in 25D, even though their 125D is off the chart. And those positive outcomes are like preeclampsia and some other stuff like that, are they not? I don't know if you've read those papers. Um, they're not really anything tangible. And I would like to see a study that somebody says is compelling those outcomes, like your friend right there, she's a perfect, perfect person to ask. If she thinks those were valid outcomes, why can't we see those with the active molecule too? Because those are all associations of better outcomes with a 25D level, which has no biological activity. How did it do something that made for a better outcome? What are the biological steps? Stay with the science, not the esoteric stuff. That's all esoteric. Better outcomes associated with the 25D level. What did they look like compared to the active form? Did it fall apart? Did the wheels fall off the bus? Why aren't we ever shown how they compare to both of them? They should compare to both of them if the deficiency is real. And in that recording, let's talk about that. The, there's a really disconnected position that you were up against. On one hand, we're trying to talk about a deficiency, but the vast majority of that conversation was about treating the fake deficiency at the 25D level to lower the excess active form. That's not a deficiency. That's like the house is full of bread, but we better get some flour. It's, it's the opposite of, you know, and you can maybe prove it in those studies by association using just the 25D. So every time they tell you we have to get 25D up to this so it stabilizes the PTH, show us the levels of the 125D and how they're linked each step of the way. And when they are linked perfectly, you just say, wow, why are you wasting your time over there? Hmm. That's a really good point. <laughs> We've known forever. This just drives 25 D tests because you go in and you're below the new goal. And, and so you're just treating the 25 D to get it to a level that you can only maintain by taking it every day. That's the reality that is now in front of everybody. The only way you're going to satisfy your doctor with your blood test all the time, probably, especially if you're above 60, because you don't naturally get above 60. And, and on the all-cause mortality charts, mortality increases above 56. And that makes sense. You would, in nature, you would never get above 56 unless somebody gave you a big fat pill of, of D that they shaved off the back of some sheep. Wow. Yeah. Uh, for those that haven't listened to the previous episodes or any on this vitamin D topic, they raised the bar, right? And, and Michael Hollick was behind that, right? With um, the national guidelines. Right. Those. Well, first what happened was Canada and the U.S. asked the Institutes of Medicine, the New York Academies of Science to look at all of the studies and, and decide what we should do. And they did, they did an exhaustive research and they said, you know, outside of bone health and the, and it's scant on that, this is an 1100 page report. Okay. It came out in 2008. I was waiting for it. It came out and they said it can be harmful. You know, you gotta be really careful with this. And they set the goal at 20. Then that wasn't going to do anything for the people that wanted to move a lot of vitamin D. And this is a time they really wanted to move a lot of vitamin D and so Hollick influenced the endocrine society and he later got it raised. Um, it's now they like 40 plus, but all again, associations, nothing real. And all the real stuff was done by the institutes of medicine. And they actually wrote papers about um, the big mistake. They said they did some math calculations and made some errors. It, it's, it got really ugly and really dirty, but the reality is they, Everybody just thinks it's such a healthy thing that they're going with what Hollick said. 
Yeah, and didn't Dr. Canal of the Vitamin D Council like warn against taking a lot of it? <laughs> no, that's that's Hector DeLuca. And he's okay. from he's from Madison. He's the um I call him the godfather of vitamin D. He says don't take more than two thousand. He's the one that says if we weren't so high calcium, we could use one twenty five D. Um Dr. Canal at the Vitamin D Council, he puts a cap at sixty though. He's reasonable in that sense too. He's there's not a whole lot going on with either Hollick or uh, Canal right now. Hollick got, I think he got fired. He got in some, he got in some trouble. It wasn't real trouble. I think it was just PR stunt. But um, he was talking about sunlight being good, and you know he's got his lamps and stuff, and he supposedly was fired. So they wrote all these pieces about poor him to probably counteract that piece you mentioned in the recording about him the shadowy money behind vitamin D. Yeah. I was amazing that that, that was published in so many different <laughs> articles. That yeah. Was, that was crazy. Um, yeah. And we, we did have a question too about vitamin D and type one diabetes. Um, if supplementing vitamin D can cause type one diabetes, if you looked into that, that I found a study here from 2014 that, uh, looks at it, uh, also rheumatoid arthritis and Alzheimer's disease causes. Them? Yeah. The role of it, the that, role of it. In, um, does it, I don't, I haven't read those. That sounds like the hormone imprinting, but it doesn't sound like you're talking about children. Um, let's see. Yeah. I'd have to, I should have sent you these. I guess we can do another round where we'll have all the yeah. studies ready <laughs> to go yeah no problem but it's, when it comes to the, the 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 glucose and all that that stuff's really complex as you know there's there's a lot of different camps on that whether there's insulin resistance uh leptin resistance and that this and that but if you really just stop and you think about plants plants have a lot going on with glucose obviously look at what they they do for us you know, with the whole photosynthesis and stuff. So glucose is, is a huge part of them. And so they control all that with the sun, you know? So again, reasonable sun, you're probably not looking at the right molecule. Although I can find, I can find molecules that are vitamin D molecules that are insulin control. I can also find mm -hmm. vitamin uh, other molecules that are not vitamin D molecules that are insulin control, like retinoids. And there's some cannabinoids and things like that. So think of a plant. It sits out there. It's in the sun. It knows how to control it. It doesn't get diabetes. So get reasonable sun and then fix those other things because there's, there's probably more at it. But if you don't do the sun piece, the other's not going to matter. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This, this study you're saying the 3 epi 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 metabolite was found in all groups with significantly higher concentration in the disease samples. 3 FE. What is that? Uh, 3 epi. Oh, 3 epi. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, that's probably that. I, I think that might be the ROC paper. The ROC curve talks about mm -hmm. disease states by looking at epi. Epi is mm -hmm. one of the ones, one of the major 25D metabolites that typically doesn't get measured. Um, epimerization pathway, okay, versus the hydroxylation pathway. So epimerization, there's a bunch of molecules in that pathway. And if you give children D3, they will make a ton of that. It'll be up to 60% of their total 25D. So if it's not on the test and they're only getting the, the normal D25 OH D3, they'll only be looking at 40% of what they have in their blood. That's an interesting molecule because it doesn't impact calcium. So those people, those disease states, they involve calcium apparently. <laughs> calcium, like you were talking about earlier. Um, calcium is probably not a good guy in the fight. Right, especially if it's, I mean, I think people are most familiar with calcium in the arteries. Um, cause that could cause serious, um, life threatening heart cardiovascular events, but just in the soft tissues in general, I mean, when it accumulates in different glands, especially in the brain, 
starts messing with your mood and your memory. Um, it could, fr- from what I see, it could kind of synergize with a lot of other things that are uh, inhibiting oxygen flow, right? And oxygen utilization. Right. And, and it's just, it's the way, if you take it orally, you're going to have to carry a bunch of it around or dump it. And there was something in the recording about going out in urine. That's not how vitamin D leaves. Vitamin D leaves in fecal matter. It's not that simple. It doesn't just leave in urine. It's got to go the whole gambit, unfortunately, really get processed. Um, so that's just how it is. Yeah, calcium, yeah. calcium, though, I just don't know why people think we need so much calcium if you really just like i said look at a cow living out in the pasture you know in the sun eating the grass it's just you're not rushing out there with the calcium pill for it are you <laughs> <laughs> well yeah the the guy I, I should put a link to his uh his book death by calcium but um he would say 99 percent of our calcium is in our bone and um you know one percent is um elsewhere you know the serum yeah um, that sounds about be, right yeah um so let me see the other question was about acne um some are saying there's reduced microbial activity from low vitamin d that can cause acne if you looked at that well, the, <laughs> again vitamin the, d <laughs> yeah the, the low vitamin d that you would be being told you have would be 25 d and it doesn't make any antimicrobial peptides mm. so um that's the problem. And those people are going to end up being high in the one, two, five D. So they're definitely, they could be lacking antimicrobial peptides just because the vitamin D can't get to the vitamin D receptors. Got it. Okay. I think that's an important point for people to get the, the vitamin D and kind of be blocked from getting to the vitamin D receptors. Cause I don't think that was part of the discussion at all during that debate. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think they address the fact that the active form is for the immune response to fight pathogens. It, it, in that world that you were in, it's to control PTH. Mm-hmm. That's its role. It's been reduced. It's the immune, all the accolades, all these praise you hear everywhere else, you go into that recording and it's all about its role is to control PTH. It's been relegated to that little tiny role. And it's kind of funny. It's, written off having high active vitamin D was written off to needing more 25 D rather than the true immune response that everybody's looking for. This is probably somebody that can benefit from vitamin D. They don't need to take it. They probably had a bump in the road. Their immune system spiked 125 D they got over it, but now they're writing it up to needing more vitamin D rather than assessing it to their body worked properly. They're going to go in in the future, dysregulate it because they misunderstand how it works. Hmm. Makes sense. And we have a bunch of questions too, like uh, working indoors, living in a cold place like North Idaho, where I live in the winter, had a ton of questions about that um, all seasons. And you've been throwing around the term a lot, seasonal variation molecule. Um, So just to kind of make it concise and, kind of one little package. Um, you've told me before, I think that you don't have to worry about it in the winter, right? We're designed to get through that without needing it. <laughs> just like all the other creatures, just mm-hmm. like all the other creatures. So when the UV index, UVB index, UV in general, I guess that's how they always have you look at it, is above three, you're making vitamin D. So that makes 25 D for the most part, we don't agree on how much and whether it's all going to hang out in serum or not. But by and large, it's a safe bet that it's going to make a certain amount of that. And so I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, <laughs> like we're during the winter. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I, got it. A, I got it. So, yeah. so when you're not making any D3, of course, your 25 D is going to start to wane mm-hmm. off. You're going to, it's going to get lower and lower. It's not going to go to nothing. You know, it might be 40 and, and drop to twenties, you know, 
in your serum. Keep in mind, that's in your blood. That's not in your tissues. You stored it all in fat everywhere. It's in all these local areas in a lot of ways. It's in the muscle there stored where it might be needed right there locally. So that one drops. So now go back and ask yourself, Every one of those studies that's pointed at a concern, whether it be dark skin or winter or any of those other things, have they ever demonstrated to you that uh, they are deficient in the active form? None of those studies say that, ever, ever say that. So just because your 25D drops, don't assume your 125D drops. It doesn't. Your 125D stays what it should be because it's the molecule of immune response. It's made daily. It's a diurnal rhythm molecule. It, just because it's December 25th, it doesn't matter. That molecule is still going to be made as you need all day long. Wow. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's, De, was... that's DeLuca's work. Yeah. Your, your body, you don't run out. And if you look at studies where people don't supplement, so they, they measured, I have this one paper, they measured them going into the fall and they did see that their 25 D dropped a little bit, but then these are people that they didn't supplement. Then as winter, full-blown winter arrived, it ramped back up. They started liberating it to meet their needs for winter, which think about it. When do you get sick? With the exception of polio, when do people get sick? The in winter. the winter. Right. That would be the stupidest immune system in the world. We would have <laughs> perished so long ago if our immune system ran off of D3, in essence, 25D. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's you finally get sick and your immune system's taking a nap. It went into hibernation with the bears on you. That's <laughs> not how it works. Yeah, that it's so funny to think I used to believe that. Looking at it now, it just it seems ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, wow. the the human body is is way smarter than that. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, that's that's when you get sick, and that's not because you have low vitamin D, and there's papers that show that because there will be some papers that will show you that, oh, their 25D is low, and that's why they're sick. That's because the people that are most sick have the lowest 25D coupled with really high active vitamin D. So they already have a comorbid condition, whether it be the diabetes we were talking about, maybe cancer, sarcoidosis, TB, Epstein-Barr, Lyme, doesn't matter. So those people already have their vitamin D receptors stolen and their 25D is low and their 125D is high because that's what the pathogens are doing. It can't get to the vitamin D receptors to take it out. Along comes something like COVID, Corona, whatever. They're already in a comorbid condition predisposed to COVID. And that's not because of their low 25D. Their low 25D is because of that comorbid condition they're already suffering. It is the marker for what they already have. Not the cause, the marker. Mm, that makes sense. Um, this is a good question as far as I don't think we've talked about solutions too much besides stop taking it. <laughs> but someone asked, can someone that supplemented vitamin D for a long time detox from it? Um, would magnesium be involved? Kind of help help things along or? Yeah, if your body liberates it and activates it, you would need magnesium. If it puts it into use, you're going to need all the cofactors, vitamin K and boron, just the normal healthy stuff. Um, you just There's just no telling what rate it's going to come out at. Um, like some people have bariatric surgery and then it, it can come flooding out after that. So it just depends, but most people it's, it takes months and months for D3 to finally, cause that's what ends up. If they took high dose, it gets stored as D3. And so it's stored as D3. And then when it comes out, it has a really long half-life, especially if it runs the cycles through the molecules. Wow. Uh, is that generally what you tell people if they get freaked out from all this info and say, Oh, I took so much. What do I do to recover? <laughs> I, I, when it comes to that, it, I have a paper that talks about what I was just telling you. And it talks about how the 
they would treat it in the medical environment with glucocorticoids and some other stuff. And I'll send you, I'll give you that paper too. It talks about how, see, if you get in trouble, you got to stop and think about this for a second. We are telling people that their 125D is dangerous and it's high. Okay. And if you're influencing making it high by putting a bunch of D in, you got to stop that because the 125D has an eight hour half-life. It's going to be gone pretty soon, but you're putting coal into the fire here that's going to last and burn a long time fueling the fire because it's way down and with a long half-life. And What's it's, the half-life of 25? I, you know, 25 Ds, uh, it's several weeks in blood, but that's typically bound to vitamin D binding protein. So if you saturate yourself, which is the goal of vitamin of the vitamin D council canal, he wants to override the vitamin D binding protein, which doesn't make any sense. Actually, stop and think about that. If I'm taking vitamin D3 and it's going into my gut, I can't override the vitamin D binding protein there because that's not even what's going to shuttle it from there. LDL cholesterol is. So he wants to saturate you at the 25D level, but he also, if you read his stuff, he's hoping that a lot of D3 itself will go and make it into the cells unbound to vitamin D binding protein. All things you can't check or measure with the end goal being measure 25D and buy my patented vitamin D while you're doing it. <laughs> wow. Um there's an elephant in the room. Is topical vitamin D any better? <laughs> I, I would say it's got to be better. Topical, your body's going to decide whether to let it in or not. It's going to get shuttled differently. You know LDL cholesterol is not going to pick it up. And your skin has all the machinery to turn it into other things besides 25D. So if, if you put D3 on your skin, your body could turn it into 20 OHD3. It could actually make sunscreen right there in your skin for you. So I, I wouldn't throw a topical vitamin D under the bus. That's for sure. I haven't seen any real studies that show like any kind of linear uh, acquisition of it by application. Be interesting. That, that might be out there. I haven't looked for it specifically, but yeah, transdermal topical stuff. I think at least you're giving the, you know, the skin a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I wonder if that's an advanced uh, advanced way to, to get sunscreen <laughs> instead of using the zinc oxide, right? Well, the, actually, that's that's funny because – so Lumisterol, pre-D3, it is it, – that's the sunscreen. That other family, the 20-OHD3 family, that's the anti-cancer family. The Lumisterols are the anti uh, – they're the um, – sunscreen and holic has a patent and actually if you follow it back a bit deluca was even involved a topical lumisterol remember it doesn't need sun to become d3 hmm. so you put that on and thermal is all it takes your body can turn that into d3 without sun because it's already past that step in theory that's patented so you could use that in winter if you wanted to but again that's that's just that'd be just like putting a vitamin D lamp on your skin to me, mm -hmm. because your body isn't expecting it. Right. Interesting. Um, let me see what else what else we have here. Um, oh, with the testing. So should doctors even be testing vitamin D levels? What exactly is the blood test saying? So. You mentioned, I think in the chat with Morley, that is it in Germany? They look at the ratio between 25 and 125, and it should yeah. be below, is it like 1.3 or something? Or... I, I don't remember what they had it flagged at on that mm -hmm. copy, but it should be under 2, 2.0. 1.6 is a really good target, but it can get really confusing, confusing because um, – so take me for example. I was uh, 24 – in the 25 D and I was 46 in the active form. 
um, it's a ratio of one nine something. But if I were to take some vitamin D and I'm not, and I weren't dysregulated, I could move my level of 25 D up from 24. I, I could get it higher. I could probably get it to a one to one ratio. But in my mind, that wouldn't be good. If I went in the sun and that happened, or if I, now I don't know what I'd want to do that through diet even. If I went in the sun and that happened, I'd consider it a good thing. But it gets, sometimes you'll have a negative ratio there. The bottom line is you have to also remember you're not in control of the active form. It's going to be what it's supposed to be or higher. That's kind of the reality. So if you're not dysregulated, like in the, recording, I would say that person wasn't dysregulated. They were having a little immune response and it was gone next time they checked. They falsely associated it with taking 25 or taking D3 and raising their 25 D. They weren't linked at all together. This is probably somebody that's healthy. Hmm. So that that's what happened there. Wow. Yeah, that half-life thing, how long it lasts for those that aren't familiar with that term uh, is overlooked in this discussion, especially in the debate that wasn't talked about at all uh, from what I can remember. Uh, and that's, that's a really good point that we can make these connections and it's possible they aren't even connected. Right. <laughs> right. When you, when you read, uh, I read a paper the other day, somebody sent it to me. They said, what do you think of this? And they had a Petri dish and they had the HeLa cells, those, uh, perpetual cells. Um, they're a form of cancer cell. And they doused it with 125D, I believe. And they made some assumption that it worked on the cancer, which that, I mean, think about that environment there. There's no uh, RXR receptor. There's no vitamin A. There's not even, there's nothing living there at all. You know, it's just, you probably could have done the same thing with Listerine or I don't know, any other number of things. It's just such a little tiny environment and i i did want to touch on for a second that you you pointed out that there are dimers and it's heterodimerization and the sad thing is that the thyroid receptor is exactly the same it turns out the thyroid receptor has one side for the thyroid hormone and the other side is the RXR. Once again, just like in the vitamin D system. So all the talk that you've ever heard about the thyroid being dysregulated that didn't involve discussion of the RXR and the vitamin A is kind of just as irrelevant as all this other stuff we're talking about. Wow. Interesting. Um, and that's and it's similar to the so can you kind of break down this like heterodimerize and dimers and all that is there a simplistic way to kind of i know it's a complex topic but <laughs> you know that actually i don't know if this will help anybody or not i just think of it as as a scale and both sides have to be occupied to make the system right to make it level to make it work um so your vitamin D goes to one side and your retinol, whichever one they decided this week, goes to the other side. And then those two receptors come together and they go into the nucleus of the cell. And then that's where they have their vitamin D or the, the DNA binding spot. And the body already knew what it wanted. It's waiting with the DNA. It parks it there. And then those guys pull in whatever resources they need and they make whatever the body already ordered. That's why the DNA is waiting there for the binding site. Got it. Okay. That was a good visualization. Uh, someone needs to make like a, a video graphic of that. <laughs> there probably, there probably is. I bet if you yeah. typed heterodimerization and hit video or, or maybe even GIF, I don't know. There's going to be, mm -hmm. there will be, um, so, yeah. so there's no telling, I, I don't know exactly how the thyroid one works then because they're kind of sneaky on Wikipedia. I think there's a page called thyroid receptor and it doesn't mention it being a dimer or a heterodimerization at all. But then if you go to the page that's called thyroid hormone receptor or receptors, 
it gives it all away right there. It tells you it's a dimer. Almost all the systems are dimers. And here, this might help people. Let's talk about uh, the vitamin D system is involved in some things that you wouldn't expect, like uh, the circadian rhythm, for example. Um, like, let's say you have a receptor that is fuel powered. Imagine that uh, that scale again, or the two-sided. That's why I like to think of it, a two-sided scale or a double-sided. There's sensors on each side. So vitamin D goes and powers one side of the system. On the other side, what might happen, so the vitamin D is like a fuel in this case. Then on the other side, cycling through there are circadian molecules. So the body is sensing what time of day it is. So it might be tryptophan, it might be melatonin, it might be serotonin. Just they're all over the body. And so that's why everything has to be two-sided. For example, if you had a uh, form of vitamin D that's involved in cleaning out the tumor environment, like removing dioxins. One side gets powered by vitamin D, the other side grabs the dioxin and pulls it out of the system. So in order for one side to have activity sometimes, it needs either a sensor on the other side or that's how it does some of its action. It might remove dioxin that way. Or it might work together with another molecule and they'll make a chemical or a biological warrior. We do a lot of different things. And I have no idea what all those other ones do with their doubles. I can only imagine. I don't, you know, I need 10 lifetimes to, I can't even take on vitamin A. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I think Morley has a pretty good grasp on vitamin A uh, and all the, the retinoids and retinoic acids that are made. <laughs> Um, I think that's that's another point people don't get with sunlight, right? That it degrades or it breaks down vitamin A, and that's one of its most important functions. Yeah, and I'm not that versed in that. The stuff I ran into is how it degrades uh, folate mm -hmm. big time, and that's why they like that 311 narrow band because it makes vitamin D so fast it doesn't degrade your folate. Um I don't really see that as a selling point anymore because the real sun degrades your folate. So um, right. <laughs> you just, that's why you get darker and that's why you get reasonable sun and things like that. But all mm -hmm. that stuff is made. If you look all those, all those CYP enzymes, they're all light. They're all controlled by light. Everything's light. You've got to realize everything is light. Right. Yeah. And I think I, I, I mentioned it in our, our chat, like I've been fascinated with like Fritz Albert pop and that our cells communicate partially using ultraviolet light emissions. Uh -huh. um, like even have a camera here that can measure that coming off the fingertips. That's a real, it's a real thing. Um, so I wonder like if we need UV light at all. I mean, I've thought about that in the past because <laughs> like Adam Bergs from a guest on my show said, how does, how did deep sea, ocean creatures do it right that don't get any sunlight ever for their entire life um and and they're doing fine like ones that actually have vitamin d receptors <laughs> yeah the lamprey the lamprey has a vitamin d receptor too so yeah that is interesting but yeah the nocturnal lamprey you've talked about right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know that is really that's really bizarre yeah um this is a good one. Uh, just a few more questions here. What what percent of the U.S. population would you estimate has high levels of 125D? I would say um, the vast majority of people that have been labeled with an autoimmune disease. Wow. And it's that's dominated by females you know, absolutely dominated by females. So you have 80% of the autoimmune diseases are in females. And I think the number is too, that 80% of all the autoimmune diseases are collagen vascular diseases. I could be wrong in that number, but a vast majority of them are. You never hear that part. That's pretty important. Vitamin D, collagen, you know, it's all, and, and other movements that are out there. Collagen's important. Obviously, uh, you don't want to waste it, but you want to have enough of it. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
That's right. Yeah, because everyone's looking for a solution to autoimmune disease, and they're going on like the Walt, the Terry Walls protocol, and like tons of veggies, and just trying all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> right. I watched her TED talk, and I follow her. I watch all her recordings and stuff. And I don't know. She actually skied the other day for the first time in years. It was pretty inspirational. That's cool. Um, yeah, her diet stuff is really interesting. And she always says there's going to be all kinds of stuff in this food I'm eating that we haven't discovered yet. And that's that's what we're talking about with the sun. If I can tell you, if I can show somebody like 70 different vitamin D molecules and their vocabulary is two or three deep, that's what I found. That's not all of them. And that's what we found on top of that again. And no one's looking. Right. And didn't you say that they just discovered it was like the last four or five years that that new um, vitamin A receptor? No, they found the right molecule for it, ligand, ligand. So when the when the 125D goes to the VDR and then we need something at the RXR in 2016, they changed that. That's the A5, vitamin A5. And uh, so. We've been, you know, it's round five, <laughs> Rocky five. <laughs> Maybe it's the right one. It does look like the right one. It reads right. like the right one. It, 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 it just makes sense. It comes into you in the right way. It can make all the right molecules that we're interested in. I, I'll send you that paper. And why is there a big reason why that's significant or? Because I think, I think vitamin A is harmful by and large, depending upon which molecule you're talking about. And it's really hard to corner that. And um, if you think about historically retinol or vitamin A, it, it's only been a topical push. It's all been about glamour and skin and, and then they've hurt people along the way. And, you know, something is amiss with vitamin A because it's added for us. And no one seems to care that one whole side of the vitamin D world revolves around it or that we just found the the right molecule. Something's going on right there. If you don't realize something's going on with vitamin A at the heart of probably destroying health along with vitamin D, both fortified in for us, uh, then, then you probably ought to just give up because you better start there. Yeah, that I mean, that was another part of my life when the wheels started turning on the subject, because you look at fortified milk and it's retinol palmitate, which feeds pathogens. There's studies on that um, vitamin D3, and then they even put algae oil in it. I'm like, OK, these three things can't be good if they're force feeding it to us. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. If it's fortified for you, it's either harmful or waste product or both. Fluoride <laughs> is the poster child for that. Um, and it gets at calcium like you were talking about, because if you look at where they established fluoride originally, it was in Texas teeth and Colorado brown stain. And both those places had a lot of calcium, which would have benefited teeth and whatnot. But they also had other health issues like you were talking about. You don't want to drink a lot of calcium in your water all the time. Right, especially without magnesium to regulate it, right, or K2 or both. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And high fluoride water will really mess up your health. Mm -hmm. You know, because fluoride, yeah. fluoride paralyzes the immune system. There's there's a really good book on it. I can't think of the guy's name, but um, it's called Fluoride, the Aging Factor. That's the name of the book. It's a really good book. It, Peter Duesberg, I think, is a co-author on it. I'm going to check that out. OK, Fluoride, the Aging Factor. Cool. Um, right on, Jim. Well, I think we uh, we answered a good amount of questions here. And um, I think the last one. Um, what, what are some good resources to help someone wake up to the truth of D? Um, I know there's a Facebook group, right? Right. Yeah. There's also Amy Prohl has a really good page. It's uh, called Microbe Minded. Um, she's the one that works with Trevor Marshall. And she still works with Trevor. Another person that used to work with Trevor is... Meg Mangin. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to say her last name right. She runs the Chronic Illness Recovery on Facebook. You can find her. It's out of Texas. Cool. 
that's who helped me. That's who helped me at first. That's who I contacted and she gave me access to her electronic library. And she set up with our doctor in Redmond, Washington, and they shared labs and everything at first. That's how I learned a lot of what I learned was reading their papers on their site. Wow. Yeah. Cause it, it's hard when you, when I start talking about this, people look at me like I'm a conspiracy theorist. Like, like, I mean, one of the questions is why are there only two people in the whole world who say don't take vitamin D <laughs> and they're referring to you and Morley. It's well, they, <laughs> they, they don't realize the, the wealth of information or who Trevor Marshall is. Trevor Marshall mm-hmm. was a fertility expert. She, um, she somebody referred to him as a engineer he i think he has a phd in electrical engineering which would be necessary we have voltage gated calcium channels this is a man who can calculate the affinity of the molecules to the receptors for us Um, that's where all that science came from he's the human genome expert he's asked to be the mc in the chair of the autoimmune congresses all around the world he's untouchable his science is impeccable and the reality is though that he has his plan he shares all of his science freely but he seeks to use a drug called binacar and it's just not a natural drug and i don't think you need that drug so we're what not a, we're not alone. It, it's a VDR agonist. Oh, okay. But it's the science is all out there. Nobody goes and messes with Trevor Marshall. In fact, this is just going to be my opinion. But we, everybody is waiting for the Human Genome Project to culminate. We were waiting mm-hmm. for all that great data. It went off with a fizzle, didn't it? I mean, it really did. Twenty uh, three and Me is a lot bigger deal than the science world. You're getting some stuff trickling out about COVID and stuff that probably is from the Human Genome Project. The bottom line is the Human Genome Project proved Trevor Marshall was 100% correct on everything that he had said. And that's why it's not a big deal anymore, because it doesn't fit the Western medicine model. That's why, because pathogens are real and mainstream doesn't want to acknowledge that. Really? Because I've been hearing it's the opposite, that mainstream medicine is all about the germ theory, and it's really about the terrain the, theory. The germ, ger, the germ theory, but what germ? What germ are we chasing? Right. No, seriously. What? What? Right now, we're chasing COVID. We chase the flu every winter. But what <laughs> germ? We haven't cured anything, and I can't remember. I used to know what was the last thing we cured, and then that was a farce. I think it was uh, – like influenza and no we said we uh, cured something that we really didn't we just renamed we hid i think it was it was probably the bird it d- does it doesn't matter the bottom yeah. line is we're not really after germs they won't tell you epstein Barr is raging in you look at how controversial the the lime world is and the ms world is and you know the pathogens are real anybody could take five minutes and pull some earlobe blood and a dark filled microscope and You'd be like, wow, look at those spirochetes in my blood. <laughs> you know, it's they used to do that. We used to culture stuff. We used to look at it. Nowadays, it's just we're not looking to cure anybody. Mm-hmm. It's a business, right? <laughs> it is a business. And that's why the one thing we make that you've been fortified with since 1932 is still not enough. And it's still going to be the answer in the future. But you've got to ask yourself. Is it a rigged game because, and are they, is there plausible deniability because there aren't any data sets of low 125 D everyone with low 125 D. And this is really important to realize everyone we discover with that has a defect activating it, whether it's their hype, hypoparathyroid or they have chronic kidney disease maybe from taking vitamin d historically already but they have to be given 125 d think about it they can't activate it they're already broken in that sense so there's no data sets of a deficiency in 125 d in the general population but we know lots of people that have high 125 d you've never heard anyone tell you they had low 125 d you've had lots of people tell you they had low d 
I have still have never seen a low 125D test. I know some people that would have them because they're hypoparathyroid. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, it doesn't exist. So right now, even if you were Robert Kennedy and you wanted to get the best lawyers in the world and sue mainstream medicine for giving everybody rat poison, there's not a data set to prosecute anybody with. They've been sure of that. That's why you can't find it. I've been asking for 10 plus years. Where's the low 125D data set? Where is it? Where is it? I did. I went through Robert Kennedy group too. That woman, she couldn't find it. She gave up. So it doesn't exist, and there's a reason. That would be a really good document to sue them over their mainstream practices if it existed, but it doesn't exist, and maybe that's why it doesn't exist. Wow. I think that, that's, uh, that's a good place to end it. <laughs> yeah, that's that'll awesome. put a target on my back, won't it? <laughs> but, it but actually, you have one more burning question I'm sure we'll get asked because people have told me, you know, I have high 25D and low 125. Let's say hypothetically that's correct. Would part of the issue be low magnesium? They're not converting? Wait, that, that person has high 25D and low 125D? Right. What If that was true, what would be? That could be hypoparathyroidism, chronic kidney disease. It's not really going to be a magnesium thing unless – I mean – the body can't choose. I'm going to let magnesium activate D3 to the 25D level, but I'm not going to get involved in its activation to the last step. No, mm. it, that wouldn't work. See, it's used at both levels. So if your 25D is high, I don't think that's true. I don't think you'd find that to be true if you followed through on the test. There's so much confusion at what they're looking at on a test. Um, that person, the doctor would have freaked out on that. Um how was that addressed? Did they say? No, I mean, it was just a, a social media message, which is very, uh, you know, ambiguous. And yeah, <laughs> that's kind of deadly. That's kind of deadly. You know, low 125 D is not compatible with life. Wow. Um, you don't have an immune response. You can't make any T cells, macrophages. You, I mean, all the, all those warriors, there's 913 confirmed, uh, genes encoded that would be across biological and chemical and then there's we know there's at least 5000 in this other gene it's called AHR there are 7000 known ligands alone no AHRE so there's that many response elements from that receptor 7000 known from this other receptor so you can imagine if we really started looking in, and that's a cancer receptor. That's why they know so much about it. If if they really cared, you have to remember that the vitamin D receptor is expressed inside of a tumor. Yeah. And a tumor isn't stupid. So if it's inside the tumor, its activity is going to involve taking care of the tumor. Is it not? It's inside the tumor. It's in the nucleus of the cells inside the tumor. And it's expressed for a reason. And so if it's making warriors, what are they policing against? You know, it's wow. not killing it. It's clearly not killing it. You know, you're dumping the vitamin D in there. It's not dissolving tumors all day long like we wish it would. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, uh, sar was it sarcoidosis and, and lupus that those issues would be a low 125? Right. No, or those high. are those are high and those both have to avoid the sun. Lupus, they okay. get that rash and lupus is like tumors here and there. I don't know a whole lot about lupus. You can't go in the sun. Uh, it, it's pretty harmful. And Trevor Marshall says sarcoidosis is what he had. That's how he started looking at stuff. And I have to tell you, those are the doctors you follow. You have to think about someone's motivation. He was helping people with fertility originally. He got sick. That's uh, Isn't that kind of like uh, Gerson? It wasn't Gerson. Didn't he have headaches all the time? And he mm -hmm. sought to juice. And Teitelbaum had to drop out of school and live in his car. And then he figured out the protocol for uh fatigue um and he wrote that book these are the doctors you want to follow he really figured out i don't know why he's really big on that one treatment benicar but um he just he really figured it all out 
and he wanted to make himself better. And it has to do with the eyes. The eyes are able to, con they make 125D. They do it even in bright light. It doesn't have to be sunlight. And um, wow. I don't know a whole lot about that because they're not going to look a whole lot into that. Um, there's not going to be a whole lot of research on the eye and how it works with light and how it's tied to your pineal gland. And that's just, there's no funding for that. Right. Yeah, I'm going to put the link below travel Mar Trevor Marshall.com. There's a list I have up of his publications. Or yeah, he has, he has, he has a, lot. a ton of papers. And then there's the MP page, of course, the Marshall Protocol. Um, mm -hmm. All his stuff is free. I mean, the guy, he's he's a genius. Absolutely, he's a genius, no doubt. Yeah, and the, the paper I referenced too during the debate uh, that kind of scoffed at it was the Vitamin D, the Alternative Hypothesis by Paul Albert. I'm sure you've read that, right? Yeah, yeah. Paul Albert's yeah. one of the ones that works with him. But the alternative mm -hmm. hypothesis is turning out to be true. Um, mm -hmm. That paper that I had about the jaw remodeling, it went pathogen by pathogen showing how it disabled the immune system via the vitamin D system. And they all do. That's why they're around today. And that's why they're not going to be addressed. That's why we're not really chasing those germs because those are the germs that vitamin D isn't effective on. So let's not talk about them because we want you to think vitamin D is effective. Right. <laughs> well, well, awesome, Jim. Uh, I feel like we're going to have more of these and uh, this is a great, great intro for people. I think you broke it down really well with analogies and um, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks again for uh, taking the time to come on the show. No problem. Get some feedback. I can be all over the boards, but I'd like to address anything that people want talked about more or less. I can, you know, we can, whatever. That's awesome. Sounds good. We'll uh, stick around uh, while I close out the show. Uh, thanks, Jim. That wraps up today's show. Hope you guys were taking notes. This is probably one to go back and listen to multiple times. I love the Facebook groups on this topic. Uh, Secosteroid Hormone D is one of them. There's a lot of really good resources in there. And as he mentioned, Microbe Minded is another page. And Chronic Illness Recovery. I know a lot of people are frustrated, especially with autoimmune conditions. It just seems like a nebulous thing where it's hard to figure out what's causing what, but I think when you get down to mineral balance and the reality that you might be high in certain things like vitamin D and that maybe taking it for years when you thought you were doing your body good was actually contributing to the development of XYZ condition that you're now experiencing. So I definitely don't have all of the dots connected. I don't have the whole puzzle figured out and anyone that claims that they do I suggest you sprint the opposite direction but the reason why I started this show is to have on experts that you wouldn't normally hear about on big podcasts these guys are not going to get a platform ones that talk about the dangers of algae oil or fish oil or omega-3 DHA people that talk about the dangers of vitamin D supplementation the dangers of ascorbic acid supplementation. It's because there's a lot of money behind these products. There are safe supplements, but most of the supplements, like I mentioned, you'll see in Costco and you'll see in the major stores, you'll see on the end cap of your health food store at eye level. Those are the ones you really have to question, especially when they're pushing tests, especially when there's a worldwide event like we've been experiencing the last year and all of the information is the same it's all zinc scorpic acid omega-3s <laughs> you really have to take a step back and say wait a minute if everyone's going this way maybe i want to go the other way because maybe there's going to be a better solution over here i've been fascinated with calcification for many years that was the first of the clf that I learned about the lipofuscin, the fibrosis, but the calcification is where I started about a year ago. And back then I had a really preschool understanding of what the primary cause of calcification was. 
it was that dairy is acidic and mucus forming and that it contains calcium, which we want to avoid. I've since matured from that perspective and recognized the lactoferrin content in dairy products. And it's really funny because you'll see vegan supplements now, liposomal supplements that include lactoferrin, and yet they're demonizing dairy. It's hilarious. <laughs> so a lot of the components in milk, for example, high quality milk, you have retinol, you have saturated fat, which is good for you, which will displace the polyunsaturated fats that accumulate in your tissues. You have the animal protein, of course, amino acids, B vitamins, selenium, copper, a lot of nutrients in milk. People just tend to focus in on whatever it is, the protein or the casein, and it all works together because people will take one component like the casein and demonize it and not look at it in terms of the whole. It's similar to the effects of just straight caffeine versus coffee, which contains nutrition, has B vitamins, orogenic acid, a lot of other awesome things in it. So back to the vitamin D thing, I've been working on connecting the dots, thanks to Jim, on how it contributes to calcification and the calcification of the soft tissue. And I liked when he said that the role of parathyroid hormone, PTH, is to tell the body to take calcium from the bone. And the role of active hormone D slash vitamin D, 125D, is to tell the body to take calcium from the gut. And that started to turn the wheels in my head, looking at people on tap water, spring water, well water, let's just say unfiltered water, of which I put those gravity filters in that same category. So the Brita, any pitcher type water filter, I put in the same category as unfiltered water because it's really not doing much. It's not removing the hard minerals out of the water similar to the Berkey system. Good for an emergency, not good for day-to-day -day water. So he had me thinking, all these people with the pitchers, with the unfiltered water, getting tons of calcium via the water, it's not the dairy again, and they're supplementing D3 because their doctor, their naturopath, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube told them, whatever, they're supplementing D3 like candy, 3,000 IUs, 5,000 IUs, I used to take 50,000 international units a day for a little while. And what that does is that raises 25D, which will then likely raise 125D. And I'm glad that we talked about that during this interview, and it'll probably be a continuing discussion with studies showing that supplementing D3 can lower 125D. I would imagine there's a lot of variables. I would imagine with a lot of these research studies, there are a lot of variables that are not accounted for. I wonder the magnesium status and the K2 status, both of which have critical roles to play in mitochondrial function. And if the mitochondria ain't working, the tissues ain't working. So I feel like that is overlooked, the magnesium status and the K2 status. In a world flooded with calcium, largely via the drinking and bathing water. I believe that most of the population is severely magnesium deficient and also K2 deficient because both of which regulate calcium. But it's something to ponder. I also thought what he said about bone resorption was really interesting, that anything above 100 of 25D actually triggers bone resorption, which is not a good thing. <laughs> it activates the osteoclast to break down the bones and release calcium into the bloodstream, which can then throw off physiology as a whole. So I feel like this whole vitamin D topic is going to be a continuing discussion. I definitely plan to have Jim back on the show. I love his passion. And I like that he introduced me to Trevor Marshall. His website, trevormarshall.com, is really cool. All the publications are listed there. And part of his protocol, number three, is to avoid the consumption of vitamin D 
as well as certain other immunosuppressive foods. But as Jim said, he's a fan of the Benicar, which is the VDR agonist. And that has me wondering, what are some natural ones? I wouldn't be surprised if spices are in there. I think I've heard him mention that, or that, or Dr. Cass Ingram. Uh, oregano, thyme, basil, cumin. A lot of these spices actually have effects on the bone, uh, protecting the skeletal system. So I'll put all the links below. I'll put the link below to Kitty Blomfield's great vitamin D debate that I was a part of with Kate Deering, Georgie Dinkoff, and Danny Roddy. That was a lot of fun, especially being the only person in that debate that was anti-vitamin D supplementation. It was like a four-on-one, which is kind of interesting. And I'm glad they raised the questions that they did because I genuinely want to get to the bottom of this. And I feel like this is another really important piece of the whole calcification story of people supplementing D3. Like, why is everyone so calcified? I think that's obvious <laughs> looking at the state of the world and elections and how people are behaving. There's obviously some inhibition of blood flow going on. And we could talk about the various factors. A lot of alternative health people will just say heavy metals and the chemtrails and this and that. I'm a little more simplistic. I just say it's calcification from drinking alkaline water slash unfiltered water. It's lipofuscin from supplementing omega-3. It's iron overload from drinking spring water or unfiltered water. And fibrosis. And then you add all the other things to it. Lyphosate and geoengineering spraying and all the other factors and it just compounds but to me the foundation of why everyone's so messed up is these accumulations especially the one that's overlooked calcification the mismanagement of calcium calcium being where it shouldn't be the soft tissue the arteries most of it should be in the bone and I always love the books that my guests recommend. Definitely going to check out Fluoride, The Aging Factor. I'd highly recommend The Calcium Lie. Don't agree with everything in the book, but most of it is really interesting. So I've been super busy here on the Idaho farm, getting ready to move to an off-grid property. I actually measured the dirty electricity with my meter, and it was over 2,000 GS units. Which I've only seen that once at my friend's house in Southern California, right across from a radio station. So I was really surprised. A fully off-grid property with tons of dirty electricity. So I'm going to have fun making videos, mostly for the MitoLife Academy, for now on YouTube, on mitigations that I do as I move in, and little things that I'm adding in for my health. You can call them biohacks, lifestyle tips, whatever you want. My website is Matt hyphen blackburn.com i have my recommended products on there and then to see the full list you can click shop on top if you're on a desktop if you're on a mobile it might be a little more complicated but to pull up the full product list you need to find the shop tab and you can see all my recommended products most of which have discount codes i'm still having a lot of fun with that infopathy device I had anton the founder to talk about the infoceuticals that beam into liquid. I've been putting all my milk through that process. I think I've been using pregnine alone and magnesium three and eight largely. And a lot of people don't know I actually have an Amazon store. So on the bottom of the Matt Blackburn site, it's a shop on my Amazon store. If you follow me on social media, I'll make coffee posts with my espresso machine. And I have a Breville espresso machine and I often get asked what's the model number and it would take me all day to respond to everybody with the model number so that's why I have this store you can just click appliances and check it out and it helps me out a little bit and this thing has been a workhorse it was recommended to me by a coffee aficionado friend uh, it's the Breville Express espresso machine and I've had no issues this is my second machine. The first one was a lot of trouble. That was the DeLonghi La Specialista. 
And this one, no issues. I've been flushing it after every pull to flush out the pipes with water, and it's been working great. And always remember to drink your coffee with food after a meal. And the amount that you drink, you have to experiment with. I always laugh at a Bergstrom that I've had on my show. He often references people that drink enormous amounts of coffee. I believe there are people in history that drink like 80 plus cups a day. If that is sustainable, which I believe it can be, they must have had a rockin' metabolism to keep up with that. But I'm a huge fan of coffee, especially roasted yourself, especially with filtered water. You could say reverse osmosis. Best water you can get. And drinking it after a meal that contains both animal protein and carbohydrates has a totally different effect. And I get this day after day. Matt, I no longer get the jitters from drinking coffee. This is awesome. And it might be a journey. It's not something you could just get off the fasting bandwagon and you're just eating again, not starving yourself anymore, and then you just add in coffee immediately. That's probably not going to work. It could, but most likely you need to take it slow and it might take several months before you can reintroduce coffee. And if you want to add cream in there or frothed milk with collagen, I like saturé. It's like a powdery consistency instead of the grainy collagen that you usually get. And some sugar, either white or maple syrup. And totally different feeling. And my supplement brand is MitoLife. You can find that at mitolife.co. Uh, working hard to get products back in stock. Um, you have to just keep checking every day uh, to see what's in stock we actually just recently upgraded our panacea product to contain more tablets per box so instead of just 150 now you actually get 240 per box so it'll last you longer especially if you don't take a lot you really don't need much with sheila jeet if you want to experiment with five tablets that's what i do but that could be a little much for people especially that have a lot of aluminum in their brain or other heavy metals, it can cause that Herxheimer's effect of detoxing too fast. So with any supplement, I always emphasize start slow. You know, with the Shilajit tablets, maybe one a day for a while, move up to two a day, three a day, and see how you feel. I prefer taking them with my coffee. So that's it for today's show. I will see you guys next Friday. Question vitamin D3 supplementation and stay supercharged.